If you're vulnerable to psychic damage from roguish language, stay away from these gibbering mouths. But if you intend on listening to this podcast about enriching your fantastical group hallucinations, you're too far gone already. Your next game is going to be cunningly twisted, and here's why. In this episode, we find some answers to how can we prep a mystery adventure with a compelling cult at its core? And how do we go full conspiracy murder board and connect the dots between horror and mystery to make this adventure really great? And how the hell am I actually going to come up with some kind of mystery to add into my personal game? Because... I need it in a bad way. Welcome to the Hook and Chance Podcast. I'm Jordan. And I'm his brother, Travis. So today we're talking about a very real recent pain that I've felt setting up a cult mystery. And this is why I need this so bad. (laughs) This takes some prep. This takes some thinking because I went into it maybe not giving it the respect that it deserved. Just like you treat me. Wow. (laughs) we're gonna get into this huh (laughs) yeah i'm coming in hot okay all right we can table that for now and keep talking about cults no i feel like you can't just (laughs) leave that at the beginning of an episode because if you're listening holy shit (laughs) you're waiting for whatever the fuck that was to come full circle like exactly a mystery (laughs) if you will (laughs) (laughs) the mystery of the brotherly drama (laughs) that doesn't really exist you are fabricating this yeah well i like to throw a little spice in to keep the (laughs) keep the people interested meanwhile throwing me under the bus (laughs) making it sound like i'm some kind of malevolent force (laughs) you're the spicy i'm the sweet (laughs) that's the dynamic No, because you just instituted something that doesn't actually exist, which makes you the spicy and me the sweet. You'll find out at the episode's conclusion. Oh, boy. Anyway, bringing it back to the recent pain that I felt, I was trying to work into this player's backstory, this place that they kind of came from. They had kind of dropped these hints that they came from a mysterious town to the far north. And I thought... What a great way to have the player work in some of their backstory, along with tying it into my story about this weird cult. So I said, well, what if I could get the player to go along with being in a cult without realizing that they were in a cult? That could be fun. And so I started laying down the groundwork for all of this in the brainstorming with the player to say, Hey, yeah, so I think the town, like, if you're from outside of the city, that you're a very resourceful small town, because in this, if you've been paying attention to some of the story beats among my game in the last couple of episodes that we've been chatting about cults and things like that, that they come from uh, a very hostile environment, and there's some big cities, and then there's, you know, small patches of really resilient folk out in the wilds. So they survive because they stick together and maybe they live on an, on the fringe of society and they have a really nice man that's leading their survival efforts and everyone's very helpful and communal and the player was nodding along the entire time and I said, and they also believe a uh, cult, they're a cult, I'm in a cult. My character grew up in a cult and I thought, well, shit. <laughs> what if my character grew up in a cult? This is my great idea. So you just got there on your own. <laughs> I was going to roll out this wonderful mystery all along the way. Yeah. Well, that's one of the biggest problems with mystery, and is ain't it, is that if they solve it right at the start, then you got nowhere to go. Oh, boy. And that's why these mysteries need so much uh, advanced thought and pre-planning if you're wanting to try to pull one off. And you always have to be ready to drop it you're very unlikely to trick the five or six intelligent people sitting in front of you. Yeah, well, this is the ego of a DM, is they go, I'm doing all this pre-planning, 
and I, when I say this, I'm saying myself. I, you know, I'm sitting at the table, jotting these notes down, going, "Oh yes, they'll never. Oh, they they, they saw it coming. Yep, they saw it coming <laughs> almost immediately. Well, shit. Yeah. And it is because, like you say, my brain is going up against five to six other very intelligent people at the table that are interpreting literally everything I say in an, in numerous ways. And one of them is going to be like, yeah, I think this is a cult, you guys. So the mystery of building up to a cult is going to probably fail almost every time. And this is especially true when, you know, the average D&D player has some experience with a DM that tries to trick them just to completely screw them over. Like the DM that brags, you fell for my trap, now take 20 D10 damage. Gotcha! <laughs> exactly. Like, why would we be talking about this unless we knew that this was part of the story? And the core to D&D is fighting bad guys, fighting monsters. So we wouldn't be talking about a simple happy town existing on the fringe <laughs> of society unless yeah. there was something insidious in there. And that is the problem. The problem is, is that the inherent metagaming and we throw, you know, we as D and D players throw around the term metagaming pretty, pretty broadly, but we will never defeat metagaming because right. there is always this idea that's running in the back of our heads. There's this narrative thread that we can't ignore. Therefore, you got to lean into it, embrace it, and learn to work with it, not against it. So, if I were to take a step back and attempt this again, I would simply let them assume that it is a cult, but of course, can they do anything about it until they can prove it? And that's where a cult-based mystery can really be leaned into. If we create a mystery around it, then they can use that metagame knowledge off of the very first step. But they get to discover details about the cult as they get to play through my adventure. Yeah, the mystery can never be, is this a cult? Because as soon as they experiment with the 50-50 chance that it is, the mystery's <laughs> over. <laughs> well, and it's not even 50 It's a 95-5 chance <laughs> exactly. that it's a problem. If there's people in D&D &D and they're not actively being evil, they're probably a cult. <laughs> <laughs> they're either the town merchant, which is also very likely evil, uh, or I just didn't plan anything this day. <laughs> yeah, so here's a rando NPC. So that's why we're going to jump into the kinship camp where we will build a cult-based mystery using some of the systems that we've talked about in the past. This is Kinship Camp, where rich histories and diverse quirks are explored between weary adventurers around the safety of the fire. So this is kind of a different main segment than we normally do because we wanted to try and bring together all of the systems that we've talked about and created in the past and make a really cool adventure out of it. Yeah. To kind of show how they all can work together. So in episodes 69 to 71, we talked all about how to structure, prepare, and run mysteries. And in episodes 27 to 29, we talked about horror adventures. And we wanted to combine some of that with what we discussed in our last episode about building cults and see what we can come up with for Travis's game. Now, you're going to have to do your best to, I mean, we're talking about metagaming previously. You're helping plan the adventure that you yourself will be playing in. Yeah, but don't worry. I've got this technique for brain wiping myself. Oh, is that the one where I just whale you in the head with a frying pan? <laughs> yeah, so I guess it's more of your technique. <laughs> it is. Not mine. And there is some technique. There's some technique in the wrist so that you don't do any permanent damage. Um, but you just kind of got to let it glance off the top of your dome. Hmm. Preferably a cast iron pan because that has some heft. So you can try that when you want to reveal your secrets to your players. <laughs> <laughs> just dome them. All right. So let's start with our mystery building. Right, so the first step of that 
is doing a little bit of world building, planning out the basic elements of the mystery before diving into how it's going to flow. And a lot of this is figuring out what aspects of world building will actually come into play. We've talked a lot about this in the past, about like not going into deep, weird rabbit holes on your world building, but figuring out what can we do to, to make sure that we have the core building blocks. The first building block that I often overlook is the heroes. So we're talking about the characters that the players are playing. And again, that metagamey stuff. They're going to suspect and know outwardly that this is a cult pretty early on. So we need to draw them into uncovering more about this group so that they can choose whether this is a thing they want to intervene with. We need a moral choice here. We need to provide some avenues for exploration. And to do that really well, we need to keep relating it back to their overall values. Like everything about this cult has to run counter or in support of the character's values. So we talk about values a lot on this podcast. And if you're new, just as a quick recap, you know, this is a session zero essential. We don't do many things without relating them back to our characters' values and getting those characters, those player characters at the table to really buy into particular values, to have these things in common. So when we did our session zero for this campaign, I had every single player at the table agree that they're going to build their characters around one of the values of equity and reputation. They're going to have some kind of relationship to it. What this does is it gives me a lot to play with from building enemies that run completely in opposition of equity and reputation. And that's how I know that the players will oppose my enemy. It'll resonate. It'll stick. If I want to make an NPC that the players love, it's going to be an NPC that values equity and, and is a champion for equity and is a champion for reputation and, and treats their reputation with high esteem. And I can do whatever I want now as long as I relate it back to those two values in some way. Yeah, and it applies to everything, but I think the antagonist is so crucial, and that's why you don't throw the Joker against Superman, because there's no conflict in values there. I mean, Superman's going to win because he wants to. Yeah. <laughs> Joker can't be chaotic enough to mess with that. And it's this core idea that really allows us to create characters that will come into conflict or into alignment with one another. So now... We need an antagonist of this cult. We need someone to antagonize the players. And so all I have to do is create one that hates equity and is really has maybe a terrible reputation. And we built out this cult and this antagonist in the last episode. So listen to that if you want to catch up. But to cover the basics, we got Zelath Azamok, who's a literal fiend demon leader of the children of the steadfast cathedral the name alone says this is a cult and that's what we were going for <laughs> if they haven't picked this up uh they're sleeping yeah. at the table and if we're going from a kind of villainous archetype a cult leader is definitely going to be a mastermind so we're going to keep that in mind as we think about how this cult leader is going to approach the problems that he's presented with yeah We've talked about this in our episode uh, about how to create great villains, but I'm thinking kind of a mix between the mastermind and the beast archetypes where like he's a really thoughtful thinker and he's very manipulative, but then when he's pissed off, he'll go, he'll go full bore. So we're talking the great mouse detective. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely wild to me how many uh, conversations you can drive back to the animated classic the great mouse detective yeah because it applies to everything it's just <laughs> one of the most universal films ever made i guess what it's, can i say it's just a core foundation to your life like everything gets built on top of the great mouse detective anyways uh his values we're running counter with equitability. Nobody's equal to him. He is the greatest. And as far as reputation, though, he prefers no reputation. He doesn't want reputation. In fact, he's trying to destroy 
anyone else's reputation as he goes through. And so what we have to do in our world building of a mystery here is give them a motive, an opportunity, and a method for their crime. So the motive, stick with me here, but I think it'd be cool if he wanted to plant capable warriors within the actual city as sleeper agents using a dark ritual to make their bodies habitable for himself. So he wants to be able to possess people because the city doesn't allow pure demons inside. Well, they fought in a war and they got rid of the demons many hundreds of years ago yeah. and tried to push them all out and push them back. So yeah, they're not going to let one wander through the gates. Exactly. But if he wants all of this reputation and he wants to be able to manipulate things as the mastermind he is, he needs to be able to get in there. And of course, he doesn't trust anyone else to do it. They're all idiots. Yeah, he's at the top of the pile. He's the cult leader. Exactly. And so he wants to do this specifically to the party. So I think his opportunity here is anytime the party plans to leave the city, you could kick off this adventure. I think we're right on the money here. And his method here, I think, is going to be abduct the party and initiate them to the cult once he gets them inside the cult's community. Yeah, so he's maybe heard of the you know, adventures of the party. He's heard about them in advance way out in the in the sticks where he lives right they're gaining a bit of a reputation for themselves and he hears of it and now it's time to get control over some of the most capable warriors now we have his goal now we need to plot out the steps of his plan right and this is really crucial for where we're going to pop the mystery off but i think step one is put a demon in position to fight the party out in the wastelands this is going to weaken him up because, you know, any good mastermind cult leader doesn't just go fight people full strength. And so Zeleth knows a lot about the movements of demons in the wilds. I'm imagining he can have demons that serve him corral the more animalistic demons and just send whatever he wants at them. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you're a demon lord leader kind of thing. You would have the ability to, like, send demons after your target. Yeah. What a great way to endear the party or just random NPCs to you as a cult leader of like, hey, you're in a bad spot. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to have people come out and save you from the demons that I literally sent after you. Yeah, absolutely. So that can be his second step is swooping in, rescuing the party, abducting them in their weakened state. And if it goes off smoothly great if they'll actually buy the fact that he came in helped them and brought them back but if it doesn't he can always pop off a modify memory spell so that <laughs> it does happen the way he wants it to absolutely like get them there one way or the other but like you say the modify memory spell is great for just rewriting details yeah and i think it'd be really good to mess with the characters if you're casting that spell as this cult leader you can play through the modified memory if you want to, or you can just describe it later. All we have to do, as soon as they cast the modify memory spell, we end the combat and they wake up and you write whatever future yeah. you wanted to take place. Yeah, there's a couple ways you could do that and I think it'd be really fun. Step three here is initiating the party members into the cult. And he's going to do this with everything we talked about in the last episode. Like, there's so many tasks that... He could use your help with, like fixing a wall, killing some lesser demons, putting up a building. You know, he's using psychological manipulation to get you on his side. Now that you're here, I could really use your help. These people, these wonderful people that look to me for leadership, they could use your help. Yeah. Be the heroes that you are. And again, this is, you know, trying to lean into the fact that you're still playing D&D &D because if everything's just too nice, then the characters, the players are thinking... Well, what's going on? Obviously, there's something to do right now that we need to solve. And finally, Zeleth wants to have the party swear loyalty to him. And if that doesn't work, kill them. Well, you know, attempt to kill them because they're a party of heroes. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously <laughs> going to... Well, hopefully it's going to fail. You never know. I might get some killer rolls. <laughs> True. So then we get into the suspects of this mystery. 
And I think the instinct is always to think about suspects as NPCs in some kind of like a murder mystery whodunit scenario. But I think we got to reframe that a little bit for this mystery and keep this in mind when you're creating your own mysteries is you got to think about the question that the mystery poses first. In this case, it's not who did the bad. It's what is happening here? Yeah, it's not a matter of like solving Colonel Mustard in the library with the wrench which is the typical idea of a murder mystery. It's a, we know that they're guilty. We know that this is a cult. We just have to figure out why and what their game plan is and make sure that we understand that they're not about to bring about the apocalypse. Right. And the way that we figured out is the best way to structure our own mysteries is that we want to have three suspects and then the truth. So the first suspect is the one that's the most obvious. Everything is going to point to them right away. Yeah. The second is going to be a little harder to figure out. There might be a, a clue or two that point to them and you can, you know, follow up on that. Then you find a clue to the third suspect, who is very unlikely, but seems pretty likely at this point in the game. And then finally, they lead you to the truth. So in this case, we just need clues to the first and second potential and then through their investigation, they'll discover clues to the third and then leading them directly to the truth. Yeah. So our first suspect here is what Zila's trying to sell, which is that he's a hero. A demon came and attacked and you've been rescued and made safe by me. Obviously not the truth. Everyone's going to find this incredibly suspect. Totally. So that means we need another suspect. I think demonic enhancements could be interesting to throw Ooh. in here. So the story there being that this cult is actually modifying willing humanoids intentionally to increase their physical abilities. So this procedure is a little unorthodox, but it's only on the willing. And someday the cult's going to be able to use their talents to remove those in power that are corrupt. So, you know, you discover this and Zeleth is still trying to convince you that they're good. Don't don't run quite yet. Yeah, we're we're giving all of these people the ability to survive in this kind of post-apocalypse that we've created. You know, why uh, hell, I would take demonic advancements. Yeah, right? I'm not so moral and good <laughs> that I wouldn't accept some cool horns and some powers of flight. I think this is really neat because the party can find this out and think, ha ha, here's the evil plot. And then, oh no, no, it's all good. This isn't the evil plot. Yeah. It's just something that's happening. And sorry, I didn't tell you sooner, but it's a bit of a shock. And we wanted you to understand us and our goals a little bit before you found this out. Sure. The third suspect here, I think would be fun to be a red herring that we can really mess with the players a lot. Use it to freak them out and send them down the wrong path every time we can. And I think it'd be good if it was actually a cultist that was punished long ago for wanting to leave, but whose desire for vengeance on Zelith kept them from leaving completely. Ooh, I love this. This is going <laughs> in a great direction. Because why wouldn't you? Oh, like, yeah, like, of course it's this person. He's, we kicked him out because he was too radical and he wanted to bring about the apocalypse. <laughs> exactly. And they only admit to that way later down the road. Yeah. At first, you're just getting glimpses of this terribly powerful demon that's creeping around every corner. And you're thinking, something's up there. Yeah, obviously. And when the party gets a good head of steam going, because they're gonna, and they're gonna be like, we think we figured it out. You know, after they they check out the whole, oh, yeah, we're actually giving people demonic powers, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And we always, we temper people's expectations. We don't want them to go too far. And then it's like, oh, shit, but there was that one guy. So once the party comes to a head and they're like, we're going to pin these bastards to the wall. They come in hot, asking lots of questions, throwing around a lot of accusations. And they're like, actually, we didn't tell you about this one guy. We kicked him out. He was going too hardcore on the demon modifications. He was going full demon. Yeah, like they can make up whatever lie they want. Oh, yeah. Start spinning some fun yarns. Yeah. And I think I'd use the stats for a shadow demon in this case because, 
you know, you've got some terrifying powers. They can blend in. They can disappear. All kinds of good stuff. Ooh, yeah. Then we need to reveal the truth. He's a body snatcher. He wants to be able to possess you. His goal is to turn you into the willing. And I think it'd be kind of cool if that doesn't work. He can just kill you and possess your body for a while. Hmm. Dead bodies just require a lot more upkeep when they're not possessed, and they have a limited <laughs> shelf life. You're talking about the rotting. <laughs> yes, exactly. Sure. So it's easier if they're indoctrinated into his cult. Yeah. And they are just like, Zeleth, come on to me. Possess <laughs> my mortal form. But another cool area that you can include in the cult's uh, under chambers is an area with some dead bodies that like cultists are spritzing like oh, whatever you want to call it boy that's gross <laughs> yeah that's absolutely disgusting and Keeping you have them... a heinous brain thank you <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. that's the that's the final clue like once they find those chambers then they'll they'll have most of the pieces that they need to put this together yeah then they can come at it uh again with the questioning of Zeleth they will have assumed that no no matter what the explanation is, they've got people that are misting bodies <laughs> downstairs. <laughs> there is no question at this point that this cult is evil. Yeah, what's going on down there? And the mystery's been solved. And I think it'd be fun to add one final tweak to the truth here, just to give the players one more shock, is that maybe this is the fifth or sixth time that Zeleth has cast modify memory on you and he's just pissed off because you keep figuring it out boy dropping in a couple of hints and some just subtle cues from some of the npcs within the cult yeah of like you know the along the track of like we've met before yeah. kind of thing oh that that's gonna be a fun one because there's no explanation for it along the way. Like, it's really hard to piece that together, but it's just going to add a lot of creepiness. Absolutely. If you can keep that in the back of your mind. Yeah. All right. So next, we want to think through the story beats. So this is just like how the actual adventure is going to flow until they figure it out. And those beats are the setup, the crime, the clues, the investigation, the trap that the antagonist is going to spring, the showdown, and the resolution. And again, if you want to dive into these as steps, like we're running through concepts that we've talked about in the past. And this was all in our mystery episodes of 69 to 71. Like we, we spent a while talking about D&D mysteries. Absolutely. So the setup. The setup is kind of just like them getting ambushed on the, on the journey by a horrible demon. Yeah. Yeah, it's whatever, in this situation, you're just waiting for them to leave the city, right? So you can spring this into action. Well, and I think it does go a little bit deeper than that. Like, in order to properly set this up, I need to drop a hint or drop some story beats in advance that there is, in fact, this town. Right. It's one of the only ones. They need an awareness of it. They need to know that it's a little bit interesting. And this is where my maligned attempt at this came from because I saw an opportunity in a player's backstory to work them into the setup to say, hey, you're fr remember that tiny town that you said you're from? Well, this is a few more details about it. Right, you're trying to foreshadow it a little bit. So that they at least have a destination and they know that it exists and that's our setup. They're going to travel there. Then the crime is... The step in the villain's plan that they stumble upon. And in this case, that's their own strange situation where they wake up in Zealous compound and they have to figure out why. Yeah. What's going on? We were fighting a demon. We got ambushed. And now we've woken up. Yeah. And the simple answer that is presented to them is, we rescued you. We found you or we fought the demon off, whatever the case may be, but we found you and we brought you back here to safety. And we have goals. Will you help with them? Yeah. Now we need to get into some clues. So going back, we're, we're basically creating clues that point to one of our suspects. Right. And the first clue here is just their surroundings, I think. 
like the party wakes up and find chambers within the cult's compound. Their wounds can be bandaged and first aid has been applied. Things are going okay now. I mean, little details even, like there's a pitcher of water and one of wine for you. Yeah, like it seems too good to be true. And of course, that combined with our player's meta knowledge that something evil is probably happening, that's going to be everything we need to point in the direction that we want. Yeah. You could even throw in a cultist with them, pretending to be new here like them, that backs up the modified memory, and they can be a nice little NPC to finally be on the villain's side at the end too. Totally. Yeah, I like that. Now the second clue, you also want to point to the first suspect. This is where you're going to play with what happened on the battlefield. Are they going to have memories of being rescued as the cultist rushed in to help? Are you going to play through that? This kind of depends on how things go in your demon fight. But essentially, yeah, that is the second clue. That that all happened and you got rescued. Yeah. The third clue, we want to point to suspect two, but still allow for suspect one. So in this case, we need to point towards Zealoth still being the hero, but then also the demonic enhancements. That's our suspect two. Yes, yes. So I think something you could do here is have lesser demons like Lemures or something shambling into the outskirts of town to be dispatched. Ooh, and then I'm thinking like even the townspeople can show some powers and abilities above and beyond just regular townspeople. Wait, what? What's happening here? Yeah. That person just blasted uh, one of the Lemures with crazy demonic energy (laughs) oh shit this is bad yeah are these wizards what's going on totally the secret twist here is that the failed transformations end up as lemures they end up as those shambling demons that zealoth takes outside of the community to have shamble back in on purpose and that's when the party of course is going to be like holy shit They're converting people to Lemures, and then they need all of the indoctrinated cult members to be like, no, no, no. We all take on this risk knowingly because we want to be able to survive better in this world. So we've taken on some of these knowing that the risk is potentially we could be turned into a Lemure. Yeah, I really like how on board with all of it the cultists are, which is, you know, inherent to cults, but just so fun to keep countering the party's realizations with (laughs) groups of npcs they're just like it's fine we know that well what's so great about this is that it's like solving a regular mystery except if you had 500 witnesses (laughs) they're all gaslighting you. yes exactly and this is gonna like figuring this out is gonna make the players feel that much better of like no we are resistant We're certain that there's something evil we're going to push through. We don't care how many townspeople tell us that it's okay. Yeah. And then we need the fourth clue to point to suspect three. But again, still got to allow for that suspect one to be the guilty party. And in this case, we have the suspect three, which is the uh, the like evil demon that has come in from the outside. We've got the like the red herring that this person this ex-cultist is out there trying to make the cult look bad and trying to take it down from the outside yeah i mean i'm sure your mind is already rolling here there's a lot of really easy stuff you can do like as simple as you see someone in the corner or you think you do or you know words are nearly appearing on the walls but fading immediately that kind of creepy stuff yeah this is where you can start peppering in some of the horror Maybe the the demon that originally fought them out in the waste turns up again and they can see it like take someone from the town or something like that. Would it be so impossible that Zealoth would sacrifice one of the lesser appreciated town members just to sell this lie that much better? Like if Zealoth has control of this thing that's outside, like he's controlling all of this. He's the mastermind. It isn't some kind of free agent outsider demon. That's his demon. (laughs) Yeah. He's using it to convince everyone of everything he wants. There is this malevolent force out there. Totally. Then we come to the investigation. And this is basically the steps that the party might take 
in solving the mystery. And this is going to be the part that you have to throw away the most when players want to take things in their own direction that you haven't expected. Everything else up to this point is just kind of like foundation setting and then you can use wherever you need it. Well, in reality, all we're doing is we're setting up some clues and where those clues can be found. So for instance, them misting the bodies is a pretty solid clue. <laughs> we need to save that step of the investigation to the very last. Yeah, if you can. But how do we pepper things in leading up to that revelation? Right. So when they first encounter suspect one, I think they could do that in the cathedral at the center of town. Uh, an encounter that could happen there is they're fighting off those lesser demons we were talking about, and they take a moment to recuperate in the cathedral afterwards. So this is where they might actually get a chance to talk to Zelith. Maybe one of the Lemures has something on them that is indicative of it being an ex-townsperson. Oh yeah. But to sell his story, Zelith could also have previously instructed a couple of cultists to sacrifice themselves, get killed by Lemures, because nobody would do that if they were controlling the Lemures. Ooh, that's an extreme one. Uh-huh. That's what cultists do. And to keep the party there solving their mystery, I mean, of course, you know, if they want to force their way out, let them. But to encourage them to solve their mystery, Zelith could have some flying demons around, like the edge of the community. Because he wants to keep you there to convert you. So he's manufactured a lot of flying bug-like demons, selling it as a migration that you're going to have to wait out if you do want to leave. Or you make them, you know, targets of like, yeah, we're being attacked. Can I, can I request your help, you brave warriors? Because I'm trying to keep these people safe. I'm a noble, wonderful man. Yeah, And I really would like some extra help because we're outnumbered and outgunned. Can you help me? I'll even pay you. Yeah, to take out like little pockets. But I really like this idea of just clouds of them outside sure. the community. Like yeah. you're not you're not leaving right now. Yeah, you kind of got to stay here. This is this is feeling very the thing, you know, when you're remote enough and you're stranded, you kind of just accept your fate. <laughs> yeah. And I, I really like this because it allows for another terribly creepy reveal later where he's got some kind of massive demon producing these little ones. Well, that's awful. Yeah. Some kind of like a brood mother Ew. situation. No, I'm already picturing it. A big sack that's like blah, 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 yeah. spitting them out. <laughs> Gross. And remember, at the end of this encounter scene, whatever, you need some information that leads to the second suspect if they haven't already gotten there themselves. So I think you could do uh, maybe give this to a character that has a high perception or something, but they vaguely recognize one of the folks with Zelith. Maybe when they first fought that demon in the wastes, this person didn't have horns, but they do now. Mm. They've been modified. Yes, our second suspect is the whole everyone's taking on these crazy demonic modifications yeah and that's when the party like if somebody sees this you know even with a passive investigation role or something like that then you can be like wait a minute you didn't have horns before i i, I, I don't want to talk about it <laughs> exactly. you know they, they try to avoid and then you kind of build some tension there and yeah upon further investigation it becomes pretty apparent that They've gone through some kind of medical procedure. You know, they've they've gone under the uh, the procedure of getting some sleek new horns added. Mm -hmm. Some fire spouts. Yeah. <laughs> These are my new fire <laughs> spouts. Yeah, it was just, uh, you know, a couple of days of recovery time. But now I have these gouting tiny volcanoes on my back. I'm putting mine right on my nips. <laughs> <laughs> my fire spouts. <laughs> Oh, put that to the list of things you're not allowed to say anymore. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So anyways, that's going to send them digging for suspect two. I think it could easily lead them to whatever dungeon that these transformation rituals take place in. And you could have a team of cultists performing that ritual that transfers the power of captured demons into cultists. You know, it's very painful. There's lots of screaming involved. But again, 
They're doing it completely by choice because they're indoctrinated cultists. And this is pretty simple to add in. Like, as the party is exploring town, at any point, they hear the screams. Yeah. Or they see somebody guarding a door. The players are going <laughs> to want to get in there. It's not going to be hard to send the players in this direction. No. The information they need to collect here is that one of the cultists is terrified and was recently promoted to taking care of the bodies that Zealoth possesses. They'll give vague clues suggesting that there's more at play here. Now, pointing towards Suspect 3, which is this rogue demon that's running around, running amok, we need one of the characters in the cult, one of the NPCs that we est- we talked about in our cult episode in the previous episode, you've always got that cultist that's like not okay with what's going on. But they're too terrified to leave. Yeah. And this person knows that there was someone that was transformed so heinously that they became the thing that attacked you outside of town. So, you know, if the party decides to dig for information, they can easily find this person and get them to reveal this secret. But if they don't, you can just throw this NPC at them. They're desperate to talk to somebody that might understand. Oh, the cult is evil. They they turn someone into a full-blown de- No, no, no. And as soon as there somebody within the cult, Zeleth himself even, is confronted about this, they tell you their tragic, shameful secret. Which is not actually what is going on <laughs> i'm sorry you had to learn through this these terrible unfortunate events but it's our secret shame that one of us was turned into a demon yeah or like yeah he's haunting this place yeah kind of thing yeah totally but of course zealoth is actually controlling this thing and that was the other red herring and so there's a step in our mystery planner where the antagonist interferes because they know that the party is getting a little too close for their comfort and i think it's kind of fun in this scenario because typically this would be like goons going after them or minions of some sort in every mystery you've always got like the attempt on the person's life that's like getting too close to the truth exactly yeah yeah but in this case i think zealoth would thank them for everything they've done to help up to this point And really just insist that they want the party to be comfortable. At this point, he could be gifting them with armor and weapons and quarters and any equipment. Like, he's just going above and beyond being as nice as possible. So that the party's like, we're after you, dude. (laughs) But you're making it hard. Yeah. (laughs) And this is really going to send the party after him hardcore. Like, they know he's guilty at this point. Now, As the players continue to investigate, they find the chamber where they're misting the bodies. And they're like, oh shit, they're keeping a whole bunch of frozen (laughs) bodies on ice or whatever the case may be. But like, okay, we definitely know that something's wrong now. Mm -hmm. And then we need the confrontation scene with our third suspect, who is this red herring shadow demon. And so there needs to be some kind of a, a showdown there where they think it might be the final showdown. I think giving the party a chance to fight or communicate with it would be good. And it finds a way at the end of this encounter to appear as its human self for just a moment to explain the situation. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Because it also puts the players in this scenario where they have maybe harmed an innocent. (laughs) I mean, like, they're not totally innocent. They're definitely part of this cult, but... You know, they they didn't get the end result that they wanted. It was, ha ha, Zaleth has been after you and has been behind this the entire time. Yeah, and, and this is your chance as the DM to give the rest of the information. So now Zaleth knows they're getting close because he's got eyes everywhere. Yeah. And he's got to spring his trap. Now, I think his trap could be throwing him in the broodmother pit because that's a fight that we got to have. Well, we have all of the aspects that we need in a good showdown fight. We got demons, we got minions, we got broodmothers, we got egg sacks, and we have (laughs) Zealith in a crazy place with multiple levels of height so that we've got lots of dynamism in this final showdown. Yeah. 
So it's just a matter of getting them there. And with their heightened desire to get Zealith, it could be as simple as another cultist trying to lead them there. Like, I'll help you take down Zealith. Yeah. Whatever you got to do. Like, you're going to know in that moment the best way to to lead your party to the trap. See, I really like this, though, because this gives us an opportunity to show the end result. Like, the party may or may not have put together the full scope of the Zealous plan of being able to basically inhabit the bodies of his cultists. And so, at this point, we can even have all their cultists drop little hints. We can have Zealoth talk through them. We can do all kinds of things in this lead up to it. Because why would he be hiding his ability now? Now he knows that the players are on to him. So yeah. we can do all kinds of fuckery yes. with them on the way to this destination. This is the height of terror going on now. Absolutely. And I think this is where that final showdown with Zealoth is going to take place as well. Like, you can kind of even combine it with the trap in this scenario. And it's great because with his possession ability, he's there giving his bad guy monologue, but through possessed bodies. The party can kill as many cultists as they want, and he just jumps to the next one. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> the monologue without having to put your big bad evil guy at risk. Yeah, it's fantastic. The wonderful thing that I really enjoy... And I'm not not trying to backpat all that much, but some of the structures that we've tackled in the past, like the horror matrix, layers onto ideas like this really nicely. You know, as a reminder, if you've forgotten uh, what our horror matrix was all about, it was series of steps to constantly ratchet up the terror. And like you just said, in that final showdown, you know, we've got Zealot talking through multiple characters like that is objectively kind of horrifying. Yeah. And in order to really sell that, to sell the ability, to sell his evil plot, to sell this entire investigation into this mystery, we've got that as the culmination of like, oh, shit, I can see what he's able to do. I understand the scope of his powers, all of those kind of things. In order to get there and really sell that, we need to build up to it slowly. Yeah. And we're doing that through those steps of the horror matrix, which are comfort, into unease, into dread, into terror, and into horror. Comfort being there to show that this is a happy community. Like going all the way back to the beginning of our story, yeah. we've got this happy community where people are thriving. They love it here. But we've got unease in that little hint that maybe everything isn't on the level. Maybe something's wrong here. I've seen a horn or two leading into dread. Oh shit, they're morphing people. They're turning people into demons. And then that terror of there's something stalking out there in the, in the wilds. And there's something really insidious. This isn't just a minor town with some dark history. Like there's some evil plot happening. And when you're doing horror, remember that it's really powerful to go between dread and terror. And to clarify those a bit, dread is where you know that something is definitely wrong. And terror is where that wrong is just around the corner. So you do these with each of the suspects in your mystery. Every time they reach that new suspect, it's in the dread state. They fight it. It's the terror state, and then they learn that that wasn't actually what's going on, and they go back down to dread. And the longer we can ricochet between that terror and dread state, is there something going on? There is something going on, but it's not it. And we're just going to keep bouncing between those two states, and that's going to ratchet up how we sell the horror at the very end. Where it all comes together, and that final fight i think is going to be really fantastically terrible for the party god it's like we fucking know what we're talking about on occasion <laughs> jesus it's like i always surprise ourselves with it yeah <laughs> wait what we did a good we did a good this is helpful <laughs> well i really hope this was helpful to you in seeing how we would actually go about building this whole mystery and 
I well, I mean, no, it was helpful for me. We practically <laughs> just wrote like 15 sessions coming up. It was yeah. great. Yeah, as many as you want it to be, essentially. You're welcome. Thank you. Now I will take my bonk. Yes, <laughs> I will erase your memory now. <laughs> It's time to go back to square one. If only I had Zealot's powers. As a reminder, you can find all of these structures under the resources tab on hookandchance.com. They're so, free. Yeah, they're just sitting there. They're waiting for you to go and take advantage of them and to hopefully help you structure some of your adventures and games and mysteries for your players Tell us what they are so I can steal your ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Harvest them, if you will. In our Discord. Yes. We would love for you to come and join our Discord uh, and and give us some feedback. Uh, how did this work for you? Maybe where did you get stuck? And we have regular hangouts on our Discord where we can talk about each one of these steps. We can actually go through the process with you. Yeah, we can build a whole fresh mystery. In addition to all of the other wonderful people that are on there that are constantly helping us and each other uh, come up with better games and be better DMs. Speaking of better DMs, thank you so much to all of the people that support this show on Patreon. You make this show possible. You keep us chugging along on our uh, evil plot. Sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. Why and not? Not just financially, but seriously, very psychologically. It means a lot that you support us. <laughs> we we can only keep this going through <laughs> the wonderful words of Marley R. Gar the Pirate. Time Warp. Nico Y. Zach G. No Ma'am. Michelle T. Antinius. Alan E. Felix R. Chris F. The Senate. Lucas D. Lila G. The GM Tim. Nevermore. Thomas W. Tyler G. Ty N. Heavy Arms. Eric R. Aldrost. Leprechaun. And Will HP. Thank you all so, so much. We appreciate your support. And thanks to Tabletop Audio for the sound effects that you heard in this episode. You can follow us or talk to us at Hook and Chance on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Reddit. You can also join that awesome community of players and DMs by joining our Discord. You can find the link on our website at hookandchance.com. Thanks, thanks for, for listening. listening and your next game is going to be cunningly twisted, and here's why. In this episode, you're going to have to